Writer's Block with Miriam Kilmurray. With special guest, best-selling Irish author, Nicola Cassidy. Adele is the story of a fun-loving dancer, Adele Astaire, who, in the 1920s and 30s, was, with her brother, the darling of Broadway and the West End. As famous, then, as her brother would be later, Nicola Cassidy's biofictional novel is a triumph. There's a little rhythm, rhythm, rhythm The bit of pass through my brain So don't distant, the day is distant But it'll drive me insane Ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome to Writer's Block, and I'm absolutely delighted to have with me today Nicola Cassidy, an Irish author who's going to talk to us today about her latest novel, Adele, which is the forgotten story of the sister of Fred Astaire. Nicola, you're very welcome to Writer's Block. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks, Miriam. Delighted to be here. No problem at all. I'm so happy to have you here. You're only down the road, and you are particularly... Interesting, because since 2017, you've just had this meteoric rise through the modern Irish literature scene, haven't you? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know if I put it like that, but it's definitely um, it's from where I started and where I really wanted to get into. It's, I've definitely had, I thought the books have come more quickly than even I expected, because yes. my, first, my first one was 2017, and it wasn't released until October 2017. So really, it was 2018. And my 2020 now we're on book three and I'm working on book four. So yeah, it has gone really quickly, quickly there's, actually in those three years. I, there's just so much to talk about when it comes to the three books. But we're going to focus today in particular on Adele because although it is a published book right now, it is published folks, COVID-19 came in and uh, got in yeah. the way a little bit when it came to the official launch, didn't it? Yeah, I was particularly unlucky in that um, I had arranged my launch for the Saturday, uh, the, I think it was the 14th of March. And I'd had, I was going to do it the week before and it was just the way it happened. It, it didn't work out. And on the Thursday, Ireland shut down completely. And it was quite unexpected. Like, well, we, we had inklings that it might shut down, but all week we were in touch with the bookshop. Um, we were launching in Waterstones and Drogheda. 
and in the end we, we knew the safest thing to do was to pull the event but that didn't mean for me like it just broke my heart to have to do that because I, I put in a lot of work and um you know I put a lot of work into the book and it was going to be the big launch date of it and any author knows that when they're coming up to a launch like that it is the big platform it is where you get your sales and it is where you kind of launch your book out into the world so to have it cancelled just at the last minute was really difficult actually and even though COVID is such a huge um you know health crisis and I have to like bear in mind like you know what people are really dealing with personally it was a blow for me but after for two weeks now after it at home because I um I was I, I was laid off my job and that as well I really didn't know which end of me was up because I know I was so disappointed and then I had to realize that it's okay to be disappointed when something like that happens to you and I got over it then. Like, I think I just, I started looking at, well, what am I going to do now? And I started looking at new projects. And honestly, once I got into my new projects, I was a totally different person than I was, I was flying away. So um, I kind of did get over it then. But we, I don't know if we, if we, what kind of launch we'll get now, because even though shops are back open and actually Waterstones is back open, you can't have, I think, more than 10 in the shop. So yes. um, launches and things like that are going to be different. And I'm just not sure what's going to happen with it. But I, like, luckily, I did get, I had quite a lot of press around um, the launch date. I mean, I, I was actually probably maybe one of the lucky ones and the last ones to get that bit of uh, push. Um, with, I mean, there's people then who launched after that, and they, I think they were probably in a worse position than me. So I shouldn't be complaining too much. Um, but it is it has changed things. And I think people are really starting to think now, well, if I can't promote it the traditional way, what am I going to do? So yes, um, like there's absolutely. always opportunities with things like that. But you're right, for me, it was a big, yeah, I wasn't a happy camper now in the middle of March. Oh, I, I bet, I bet. Well, just for the benefit of our, our viewers and listeners, I'm just going to give a little bit of background to anyone who hasn't come across you, across you yet, which is highly unlikely. But <laughs> Nicola Cassidy is an Irish writer who since 2017 has ha risen rapidly through the ranks of Irish modern literature. Nicola has published three historical fiction novels, starting with December Girl, published in 2017 by Bombshell Books. Then came The Nanny at Number 43 in 2019 through her current publisher, Poolbeg Press. And following that then, Adele, again published by Cool Bug Press, and uh, that was again, as she's just said, 2020. Um, so Nicola, in this case, Nicola may uh, she may indeed be able to kind of relaunch, perhaps through some of these other areas that she's been working very hard on, because she's a blogger and she's also founder of Aspiring Authors Ireland UK. She's founder of Irish Historical F Fiction Festival. Um, she's creator of the hugely popular award-winning lifestyle blog called LadyNikki.com. She has occupied the posts of marketing manager, political press officer and journalist, having attended uh, Dublin City University and gained her BA in journalism. So although you might be worried about perhaps what it will look like to launch your books in future, I'm pretty sure with that pedigree behind you, Nikki, it's going to be so easy for you to find a way to get around that. Between yourself and pool bag, you'll do that. Yeah, no problem at all. We'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be fine. As I said to you a little earlier, I finished reading Adele at about 11 o'clock last night. And it just, I read it from cover to cover and I could not put it down. It is stunningly beautiful. Oh, and it God. is an extraordinary tale. I mean, Adele Astaire sister of Fred Astaire, had an entire career dancing with him long before he ever went into movies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he did. Um, they, were chill, they were child stars and they were on the vaudeville circuit, which is what, what the entertainment circuit would have been um, before cinema came to kind of pass and came to be the, the, the most popular ent public entertainment form. So they would have been trained as children. They, they were born in the Midwest. They were born in Omaha. They went to New York and Adele was the older sister and she was the one marked for, for talent and for charisma and for dancing ability. There they are, yeah. So um, they, they, they trained until, right up until they were about 18. So they had years and years of stage training and they were highly professional by the time they were um, hitting Broadway at, at a, in the early 1920s. And they had a hugely successful career right up until the midnight around 1932 when Adele left to get married and in all that time they were hugely successful they were famous they were um, 
followed by paparazzi. They were uh, the royal royal royalty in Britain loved them. Um, they were big in America, but they were really loved in London. And they had this huge career, huge career. And Adele was really at the height of her fame when she got married in 1932, um, more so than Fred. And when I realized this story, um, when I came across it, and that she has really fallen from memory, that nobody that I knew, I'd never heard of her name till I uh, just found it in passing. And for me, it was a story that I wanted to retell. And I, the whole reason for me writing this book, which is very different to my other two books, yes. you know, it's historical. Yes. Was I just had this burning desire to tell this woman's story. And I wanted to go back and bring her back alive because to me, even though obviously I never met her, um, she was very much alive still to me. And I felt like her spirit was still still around somewhere. And I wanted to um, put it into a novel form so that now anybody who reads it will know her story and she's back in our modern minds. Um, and that was my burning reason. To, I just had, I felt like I had to write her story. And I don't know if, if that will come again because um, I'm working on new projects and, and they're kind of different. But yeah, there was just something about her that I wanted to tell her story. And I'm so glad I got it all done. And it all came together in the way it did because it'd been on my mind for a number of years. And then it, it took me until, you know, the time to research and the time to, the way it fell into my contract to put it out. Um, I'm, I feel very lucky that it, it did come that way. And did you yourself have to pitch it to Poolbag? Um, yeah, well, yes and no. Like um, I had a, a con- I have a three book de- deal with them. So I'm contracted to write three books. And I had told them the story on my first visit up to the office to meet them. And yes. I said, I'm writing the story. And um, I suppose their worry was that it would be too biographical because Poolbag is a real fiction house. So they were worried maybe that how, how, is, how are you going to tell this in a fictional way? I was like, I don't know, but I'm going to do it, you know? And I kind of had, had it quite clear in my mind um, that it would be okay. And we were very purposeful around like the cover. The cover is um, obviously not Adele um, and I don't have any photographs in her because it's not a, a biography and it's not a, a memoir type book. It is a fictional book. Um, but I drew on everything that I could of her in, in reality and um, everything that's in there about her as far as I'm really concerned, it happened um, because of the research that I did. I've put fictional characters around her, but nearly everything that Adele, even down to what I think she's saying, I would have based on maybe real conversations that I know she'd had through my research as much as I could. Absolutely. And I saw in your author's note that you specifically call it a, a biofiction yeah. novel. Biofiction yeah, novel. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a few around there. Um, I'm not the first to do it or anything like that, but the, no. they're maybe not that common. And in some of the press I was doing, um, a couple of people picked up on it. But I think it's a lovely way to tell a story because you, yes. you're, you're basing it on truth. You're telling somebody's story. And for me, I watch numerous amounts of um, material on TV about people's real lives. I, I always find myself drawn to real people's stories. What happened? And it, it's almost sometimes stranger than fiction. So um for me, like to take someone's truth, but write it in a fictional and a narrative form. I just, yes. I really enjoyed the process. Um, it, w- it was different to fiction. Like, and I had to, at the start, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to structure it. But once I got the yeah. structure in place, um, it really flowed. And I really enjoyed it. Like, I suppose you're trying to almost channel what Absolutely. you to someone's voice. You know? Yes. Yeah. And I could see the, if we can just go to the start, actually, just as you bring it up there. It's very interesting because you, you introduce very quickly three or four female characters. So we have Adele, but we also have Ellie Morgan coming through. You know, we also have Miss Chambers coming through. Um, and and you, you cover that ground very early. Did you want to introduce the female figures um, that early? Was there a reason for doing that? Did you feel that you'd get a better run on the, on the narrative if you did that? Because you come back to a couple of them very purposely at the end. Yeah, I think that that was the fictional part. I wanted to tell a story. And um, otherwise, if I just started at Adele, started her life and finished it somewhere near towards the end or somewhere, some point in her life. To me, that's just a biography type book then. So the creative part was to bring in another fictional story around it. Now, some of it is based on truth. um, And where that came from was an Irish woman that did go with Adele over to America and settle with her over there. So that was based on truth, but I purposely didn't look into that part of the story. Since the book has come out, I've actually been talking to the family that that character is based on. There's loads of stuff that has happened since the book has come out. But as far as the, as the writing, I put that all out of my head. I just had this nugget of the story, this other female character that became a confidant of Adele. And through that, then you're able to give a reflection back of the character. So 
Yes. It's not all Adele's point of view. You're able to kind of, and also I wanted the Irish connection because it's a huge Irish connection, but I needed to show that Irish um, juxtaposition of the Irish character with the American coming in. And so, to, so I did that too, but by creating an Irish character in it, you know. So um, that's how the structure came in. And I think that's maybe a little bit of experience. I think I would have struggled with that a few years ago, whereas I was kind of confident in that structure and understanding of kind of narrative structures and how you can tell people's stories through other people. Well, I, I was aware, all right, that uh, Fred Astaire and his sister had a connection with Lismore Castle um, because my, my uncle was from the area himself. But I thought it was absolutely wonderful the way you built that story up. I mean, Lismore Castle is a fantastic place. It's such yeah. the the river Blackwater and the the luscious greenery around it. It's got it's a fantastic it's an place. Incredible place. It's like a palace, you know. And for her to 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 be queen of that castle for so many years, and that was what drew me to the story because I'd seen um, a documentary on her husband, or family, his family home, and they said she had married into the family and. She she was lived in Lismore Castle in Waterford. I was like, what? I I don't. I'm from northeast. I'm not really familiar with the place <laughs> that much. But um, I was going. This is an amazing connection. So yes. I went went to see the castle and luckily got a tour, and that really helped me in writing because it is it's a closed castle. It's it's not open to the public, but um, they do hire it out if you're very wealthy. <laughs> yes. And, um, so I luckily got in and they're very kindly. Um, Dennis Denner showed me around the castle and so I would have been in Adele's bedroom and I would have seen all. Oh, fabulous. And so that was part of the research. And to me, that was, I ha almost have to see it visually to be able to write it. So. Oh, you did, you did. And you did a, and an absolutely amazing job with that. All the detail, you felt as though you were in each room, you know, yeah. in her bedroom, in the living room, doing the walk up the driveway, the gravel driveway. It's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, as without giving away the plot too much, because I know we don't want to do that, but Adele had a lot of tragedy from her late thirties onwards. Um, yeah, well, and actually some of that seemed to be when she was living in Lismore Castle, didn't it? Yeah, I think it was probably a bittersweet time for her. Um, I mean, she came into the marriage full of hope and I suppose she really thought she was going to live happily ever after in the castle and she certainly tried to and she spent her, her early years there redoing the castle so that would be her home but her husband was a chronic alcoholic um, yes. she had a number of pregnancies that didn't work out for her and they you know I think that would have added possibly to his drinking as well so she um, she had a kind of a very tragic life and I go through that in the book um, and I think she, this is him in that photograph behind yeah, me there. That's Lord um, so that is uh, Lord Cavendish on the very on my far right, and Adele, and that's Fred and Fred's wife. Um, uh, Dorothy, and, wasn't it Dorothy? Um, oh my God, her name has slipped my mind, but no, it's not Dorothy. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, once I leave a book behind, I can't remember. <laughs> You've moved you have on to, to remind me of the characters. I'm way ahead. <laughs> I can't normal. remember. That's terrible. I can't remember her name. Yet. But um, you can see no. they've, got an, they've got animals and all that. They were crazy. Adele was crazy. Crazy about animals. animals yeah. Yeah. And you can see, I mean, she was such a sporty figure. Yeah, she you was. Know, she was me. really, really fit. And um, somebody told me she used to be out jogging. And, and right up to her old age, she was very, very fit. She was very Really? Fit, right very up petite. to her old age? Yeah, she was a hu um, huge fitness fan. So, which is funny because like we kind of think of fitness as modern, but she was very fit. She was trained from young to be fit. Um, she was very careful about her diet. Yes. Um, she was a very petite, little tiny thing, you know, and, but she was very fit. And I think that was the contrast with her and Charles because he was such a big drinker. Obviously his fitness would have failed at the end. Um, but she loved the country life. Like she was, she would have been out walking and um, cycling and, and things like that. She was, she was, she was around about the place, you know, people would have seen her. And I love, well, just looking at the book, I mean, you managed to introduce the movies very late. There was so much um, to talk about in talking about her. I think it was about chapter 40 by the time you actually referred to um, Top Hat and all those movies, you know, because it really wasn't necessary to bring that in. No, There's so I'm... much to talk about when it comes to just him and her as brother and sister and her experience. And I think uh, the... the the first baby that she had, which unfortunately passed away, I think she was 37, you said, in the book by the time that happened. Was she that? Was she that? Yeah. Um, I didn't know though she was that kind of 
older. I thought it was younger, but she was, I, I'm not sure that must, that must have been her age um, because I would have referenced all that. But she, Persimmon. Charles was younger. Charles was a, a number of years younger than her. So I think she always felt that. And, and she felt that um, when they were courting and that as well, because he would have been back in London and she was in the States. And she was very worried about him womanizing and younger women yes. became. And that, and that is, I think, a theme. It always becomes a theme, especially in the performer's life when they reach their 30s as a woman and you start feeling the effects of age. And she was, she was very tired by the yeah. time she got to her 30s, you know, because she'd been on tour all her life. And yeah. the shows were very, very strenuous. They were touring all over and um, like they were going through a pair of shoes a week, like they were wearing them out from dancing. So Absolutely. They were, they were very, very kind of, it was, it was I, if anyone never saw River Dance or that, you see how intense those type of, um, what those, they're athletes really. So yeah, she was tired and everything, but um yeah, she, I mean, she still, yeah, she definitely kept her fitness now towards till the end of her life, as far as I know. You bring in very early in the book to the relationship that they had with their mother Anne, um, which I thought was lovely. And what was interesting is that they didn't have a love hate relationship with her. They actually really cherished her. She wasn't one of these showbiz mums, you know, who pushed too hard. They were actually on board with whatever she did. Yeah, I. I'd read in other places some people had said that she was a bit, like considered a very show business um, mother, but she did it in a very loving way. I think she wasn't, um, you know, get the gig at all costs. She 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 put all of her time and effort into um, those children. As like, they left when Adele was very young to go to New York, and and the mom and and the children lived in New York on their own for a number of years. The dad yes. sent the money over, so that was hard. And um, in I read um, Fred's biography and he gives a lot of details so that gives a lot of colour but um, the mother used to walk out of the apartment when they were young to get a break like like Annie Frazzle's mum would so she, probably, she she sacrificed a lot to bring them through all their training but yeah. they always seemed to want it I don't think it was ever really pushed on them they they grew up with it they were talented they it became their career and it became they wanted and particularly Fred wanted yes. to dance and be a, yes. and create and he was a creative person in the relationship Adele just wanted to dance I think and perform she was like the performer but Fred was the creative and so I, I don't I think the, the relationship while complex for other reasons in that I think the mother found it very hard to let them go as they became adults it was a very much a menage a trois type relationship the three of them were against the world yes. and if anybody came in like a, a partner or a potential partner she didn't like that at all she didn't so what, like that it wasn't yes. that straightforward of a relationship yeah um, but she was certainly um, a driving force in in their lives and right up to the end um, their mother nursed Charles even after Just Adele actually left say, this more castle, yes. their mother, um, she yeah. really took to Charles and she really looked after him when he was very ill um, from alcoholism. So, and, and she was, I've seen lots of pictures of her in Lismore. So she, um, she seemed to live with them for most of her life. Like, I'm not sure what, if she even had her own home at times. She just lived with her son and daughter because they were so wealthy from, from performing and that. And they lived in a lot of hotels and suites and things like that. Now, one other thing that I noticed was uh, the way you brought in war, because I mean it is a, an historical um, a fiction novel that you've brought that you've written here, and but you've managed to work in World War One and World War Two in a very interesting, very personal way. Um, you know, yeah. he was called up for war, wasn't he? But he he yeah. just he was it was on the cusp of the war finishing. Yeah, he wasn't called up till nineteen eighteen, and um, they were very worried that he would. Fred would 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 be would be gone, um, and luckily he he just missed out. The war ended in September, I think, nineteen eighteen. Um, yes. But World War Two, he was obviously um, I'm not sure what age Fred was in the, in the war, but he had an interesting relationship with the war in that he was he would never have been allowed to go and fight. I think as because they were they were seen that actors were seen to entertain the troops so yes. they would put out a lot of films during that time to entertain the troops and that was their part of the war effort um and he but he did go and tour uh, during the war and he came to london during the war and met adele and um they everybody begged her to dance when they met and she wouldn't do it she just felt that, you know she she let him do his thing she would have been well able um but yeah so the, yeah they they did and really i finished the novel around that time because that was kind of um as, as the book goes through I just felt it was a nice kind of time in her life and we'd already covered quite a lot of what happened to her yes and, and it, also she has because we, we I, I won't mention all the tragedies because we want to leave it for the readers to to talk um, about that themselves and read about it themselves but 
one of the lovely things about the, the, the book is how she did come back to her talents and her talents healed her. And she ended up working with the Red Cross. She was, yeah. she was performing for them. She, she really seemed to find a home in that. Yeah, well, I, um, I'm not sure how much performance there was. She certainly danced with the soldiers. Um, but really, I think her job was to, um, she was a letter writer. She, she got this job where she wrote ah. letters for soldiers in the Red Cross. Um, I think it was called the Rainbow Centre. It was where so Rainbow Centre, yes, I remember you yeah. mentioning it in the book. Um, and there's a lot of American soldiers and came through and they loved to see her. Um, so, yes, yeah, she wrote letters during the war. That was, the, that was her, her position that she was in in the Red Cross. And um, I have her singing and that. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know where I got that from, if that's true or not. But um, she, she was very, she wanted to help. And the reason that she had got involved with the war effort was because Liz Moore was an invalid home during the war, World War II as well. It was a recovery home. Rec rec recuperation place for soldiers so she had already a bit like if anyone's seen the Downton Abbey episodes where the um the house becomes the, the hospital ward that happened in Lismore as well so ah, I see. when that was I think maybe that finished then she went over to London to help with the efforts so very interesting like times that they lived in to live um, you know to live through the whole uh, 20th century and maybe just now some people are perhaps getting a Maybe they have just a better appreciation of that now, particularly as we've come through this COVID crisis. You know, we suddenly start to appreciate that in the 1920s and 30s, people just went from one yeah. um, very unstable situation to another. First of all, you've got the First World War. You bring in also, um, Nicola, the Wall Street crash, which was very important, a huge event for a lot of people. Then the run up to the Second World War. All kinds of life-changing experiences were huge, going on yeah. within the space of 15 years, 20 years. Huge, huge events. And I think it was, a, well, the, I brought those in because I kind of knew, I understood what had happened to them and it was reflective of the career as well. So um, when the crash happened, Broadway was affected, shows were cancelled and yes. that affected their scheduling and they, they lost a lot of money these days in the crash. They lost a lot of their savings. Um, but yeah, I think you're right with the, with the pandemic and all of us now going through this crisis. It's, pro it's certainly the first uh, crisis of my lifetime that I've ever seen anything like this. But And all I can think of is because I do so much historical research is this, some of this must have been what it felt like to have, say, your freedom it taken away been, or because your 1921, um, health, 19... people dying in mass numbers. and. Yeah. Um, Spanish uh, yeah. flu, Spanish exactly, flu yeah, would have exactly. been during the time in America, during the time they were dancing, they would have been caught up in all of that too. Yeah. It must have been a really difficult time for people. I think so, but um, but this is the resilience of people. Like we, we look back, I think we, that's why histor I love historical movies and I love historical fiction because yes. you go back and you see how people coped yes. and they seem to have coped really well because I, I, th I think we look back with, with our rose tinted glass, which is we have a stable, we have stable lives and stable um, countries and stable economies. And then we, we go back almost as entertainment to read how these poor people yeah. you know, survived all these other incidents. So that's why I love sure. it. I love historical um, material. Now, the voice uh, that you, you pick, the voices that you go through are, are at the beginning of the book really fascinated me too, because when, when you, they are speaking as a child, you are using the language, the grammar and the vocabulary of uh, a five-year-old of a 13 year old you know you really switch into that very very well indeed which isn't easy to do i've had to do it i've had to go back and write um myself as a 13 year old in tehran calling you know and it's you have to actually be really careful you don't speak as yourself as an adult now you have to go yeah. so you really did that so so very well and the the kind of language and how it evolves um you, you changed it very noticeably for ellie morgan and, and, and the grammar that you're using and, and the, the style of language for Adele in the 1930s, you, you make all those changes and transitions very, very well indeed. It's a fascinating read. But let me take you now back to 2017, December Girl. Now, you actually got on a bestseller list with this, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Your um, first on... novel out. Amazing. <laughs> Well, I was luckily picked up Amazon. If anyone's ever released Amazon um, books, um, it can get picked up for a sale or can get picked up for a promotion. And it, it happened to um, luckily do that. And it did go to number one in some of the charts. Um, so I was delighted, like, because you can have that then, you can say that. Um, yes. But yeah, like, well, I think December, they always say your first book is like you, <laughs> you know, all of you in it. And for me, like, it, it really has because it's set um, in my home 
area where I grew up and um, it's the story of a girl and making her way coming of age and everything so um, December Girl has like, such a massive piece of my heart like because it was the um, I do think there's a lot of me in it um, and I really yeah I really enjoyed writing that it was very it was difficult to write for me because it's my first novel and I really learned a lot on that um, looking back on it now there's probably things I would change and you know probably things I've learned that have brought on through other novels um, sure you know yeah. but that's that's fine like I, every I, I think you know, there's a lot of talk around de debut writers and um, sometimes debut writers can get a lot of press and maybe writers who are further on don't get the same. But for me, every time you write, you're growing and you're learning. And I think we should look at people who have a number of books out because um, obviously their their craft is just getting better all the time. So, yes. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm so happy with December that it, it came out in the way it is. Um, but I suppose looking back now as I go into book four I'm thinking oh my gosh should have changed this should have done that a little better but that's natural I think and you just have to go that's what I put out and I'm still happy with it you know absolutely and of course then you also had the nanny at number 43 mm -hmm. which um, was 2019 wasn't it that was your, your 2019 yeah. publication yeah so I had when I was writing December Girl and I was really struggling with how to write a novel I got fed up um, about 30,000 words in and I said oh I'm going to start something new this is going nowhere and I sat down one day and I wrote the first chapter of The Nanny which is oh, The Nanny arriving into Drogheda so I wrote that in 2017 I think or 2016 I can't remember and that just sat there on my laptop then then I went back I was like okay I'm going to try again December Girl and uh, I was reading a lot of its structure and I was I got um I just was trying to learn and I said, okay, I'm going to write December Girl and I did. And then that went out and I was like, okay, while I was on submission, I better try and write a second novel. And then I went back and I opened up that chapter and I just opened it up and just started writing and just the nanny came out then, just arrived. Like It wrote itself. Yeah, it really did. Like, it really, honestly, now there was, there was some parts where I had to come back and rewrite and I introduced a few new characters and there was little plot changes. But the nanny flew, like I think I wrote the first draft that in about nine weeks, it just went plop out onto the page and then yes. I rewrote it obviously it wasn't like um you know it wasn't and then we edits and that as well um but I did enjoy it I enjoyed the structure of it and I enjoyed kind of the the crime element to it and putting it all together I really did enjoy it I can imagine that can I just ask you which came first did your blog Lady Nikki come before the writing of the novels yeah long um, before, and yeah. it did so oh, and, yeah. and how how did that just from from uh, the writer's block point of view discussing other aids and tools that can help you as an author when you've published a, no a novel how useful was it for you to to have that very popular blog site still up and running and you know w did it work in your favor yeah yeah oh like it had a huge impact um in a number of ways i started in 2013 so i had oh it was going went, that long yeah it's, it's it's on the go a long time so i have to go back through because god only knows what posts are up there for the early <laughs> days <laughs> i don't know what's up there um because it's about two or three hundred posts i think but um i started it because i was working in a marketing job in locally and i went to a blogging conference i was working in tourism and it was a good travel tourism type conference and i went to a session on blogging and i didn't know anything about blogging and I went to the session I went I am going to come home and start a blog so that's what I did and I had no idea what I was going to write on it I was just I was just about to get married and and of course I had my first baby then and that kind of it became a parenting blog at the start yes. Um, yes. where I was just detailing you know raising this little baby and my experiences and then I connected into a lot of other bloggers in Ireland and from that I formed friendships and I understood how, how other bloggers were you know running their own blogs and being very successful and I could see some lifestyle bloggers emerging and like it was a very different landscape 2013 2014 like in a way for me blogging has completely moved on again it was very popular and at its peak really before Instagram was was very big um and in the influence of culture was kind of only building so I was kind of a part of that for a little while and then then I decided I'm going to write my novels now and once I decided that I was using the blog to interview other writers so a bit like yourself with writer's block I was putting out posts every week on different interviews and I got to interview a number of authors and I loved that connection with other people to see how yes. it's it called how I write so yes. I found out how other people wrote I did that for a whole year and then by the end of it, I was still writing and learning myself. And as I progressed, I'd blog about it and say, I got, you know, I, I got my novel done or I got an agent, I got a contract. So it was coming along with me all the time. And it was um, somewhere just to express myself. And with novel writing, you know, we could write a thousand words a day and they might not see the light of the day for three years. Whereas yes. you could write a thousand words in your blog and it's up that day and people are 
you know, in contact with you about it and you're conversing about it. So I love the kind of instantaneousness of it, putting it out. Um, and I love just the kind of, you could be a bit funny or you could just say what you wanted and nobody could say, you can't say that because it's my blog. I could say what I want to. Yeah, you can say what you want to. It's offensive. Um, (laughs) So I just really enjoy that expression. And um, it's still up there. It's just in the last number of years since my writing has gone this way, my blogging has gone down. But I think that's natural anyway. A lot of the bloggers that I am still in touch with really have left a lot of their blogs behind. Um, I think people are really posting their stories and their, their, um, you know, their daily kind of material on the social media platforms. It's just moved on. You know, it really has. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm at the moment, I'm building a new website at the minute and I'm trying to work out, will I, will I keep it up? You know, because, um, part of me is just, I just feel like I've moved on a bit and should I leave it? But, um, I've left it now for a number of years. So I'll just see, there's a lot of material up there and there's a lot of my family's material, like my kids as they were, you know, growing yes. as well. So, so it's very personal, but it definitely helps my writing. And it was, um, yeah, I would. I'm just not sure if I'd recommend it nowadays for people to start a blog because I think times are different. I think times are different. I agree with you. Your though, LadyNikki.com is still so very well established. It could be worthwhile just keeping it going. But I agree with you. There's been a bit of a, a U-turn now, hasn't there? People are focusing more on social media, on Instagram, on YouTube, going directly to YouTube, doing their blogs on YouTube. Um, I had my she writes for a little while, and exactly the same thing happened to me. I suddenly felt. Deep down inside, it was a gut feeling. Gosh, I'm not so sure this is the way to go. Yeah, I think something's about to change. And yeah. I stopped it for that reason too. So I think your antennae are working for you yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you just don't want to put, I, I just find my interests move on. Like I'll, I put time into something where I'm getting a lot back from and I got yes. so much back from the blog. Like well, I really did. That is um, a very good point. You need to know that you're getting something back from this, don't you? Yeah, you need yeah. to actually. And, it's, and it's, your, it's your self-satisfaction in your writing or your work that you're putting out. And for me at the minute, like my novels are where, you know, that's my main focus. But I'm also already moving on in different ways into like, um, say, screenwriting is my next big goal and my next I'm training that at the minute um, excellent it's very, very different to novel writing but I'm um I'm at the point now where I'm really ready to start writing scripts and very good doing that so that's my next thing and I'll always evolve I think into into what interests me um but I'll train and with the screenwriting could that be um in is that a particular area of screenwriting are you still are you looking at um historical programs um, are you looking at science fiction is there anything any genre you'd like to go into well, but really historical is where i'm at because that's um my my i suppose my expertise at this point like the, with the novels i've done the research i've done but it, <laughs> writing historical for tv is very difficult because it's very difficult to get it funded so i'm going in going is there any point in me writing all this historical material at the start because um i'm so i'm just because i'm a newbie and a beginner really what I need to put out is just material and see, can I write for TV and see, does it work for me? So I'm working on more modern material that I can maybe shoot myself or I can get made so that I can start having a show reel and things like that. So, um, also like the, I did a play a number of years ago and it was a modern play with, with a comedy edge to it. And I'm finding the material I'm writing now is almost similar. So, oh, yes. um, I'm certainly going to try it. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it'll work out for me, but it's, I seem to just be able to do that. And I'd, I, I'm a huge fan. I watch a lot of TV and film anyway, and I always yes. have done. So I'd love to get into TV writing. And like, I'm a huge fan of um, Fleabag or Catastrophe and um, all <laughs> yeah, that kind of right. material. I love all that. Um, and that would have been, too. my blog would have been a little bit like, quirky like that, say, a little bit. So we'll see. That's my big draw. Um, but I think I would be well able to write historical for screen as well. It's just starting off I don't know if that's a realistic you know I, you can't be Julian Fellows even even if you really want to be you know um, I so know I just have to be realistic but that's what I'm learning I'm learning that the screen trade is very different to the novel trade you know you can you can write your book and get it sold your screenplay is a very different thing so uh, I'm yes. but I'm learning I'm learning you know it's, you are it's learning to me yeah yeah absolutely and creators have to take risks you know you yeah. have to take risks you have to experiment and and it's all part of the journey just take us to the project you're working on at the moment. What are you able to say about that right now? Are you able to tell us a little more about what you're um, writing, the novel, well, you're, the fourth novel? <laughs> I got it stuck at the minute. Like I'm, I switched. I had, I had this great idea. Don't say you've got writer's block now. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of have at the minute. It drives me nuts. Um, no, I had this idea about a, 
London Victorian story and I still think I'll do that idea but because of COVID I needed to go to London to research it and I needed to make a number of trips and that all got pulled so I know I'm not going to have the time to re read the amount of material and, and research for that story so I'm parking that story so that was a decision in itself like even that because I was already researching quite, quite heavily into that yeah. so I had to go right putting that aside and then I thought um because I was locked down in Termenfecken where I live yes um I had been reading a lot of uh, local material and local historical journals and um there was a character um not like Adele but similar in that she lived in a big house locally and she had a big impact on the community in the 1920s and 30s and I thought may, maybe I'll write her story so I'm at the moment I've done a huge amount of research into that and I've spoken to her family I've done a number of interviews and I have started that story my problem is um I don't know where the story's going <laughs> at the minute because she wasn't famous like Adele Astaire who followed a particular career. Um, she was a member of the community and a lot of her family is still alive and, and with Adele, I didn't kind of have that. It was like somebody that was a part that I felt very easy writing about. So that's my writer's block at the minute. It's not that I can't find the story or think that she has a good story to tell. It's about my relationship with telling it as, as a storyteller yeah. and how, how yeah. comfortable I am about bringing fiction into a person that, you know, wasn't a famous person say so I'm trying to work that out um into how far you can go ethically and and um, what would you say to to writers when they f sometimes people can panic when they find that they're actually getting into the serious nitty-gritty part of being an author now and having to make decisions just like what you're talking about there okay I'm going to park that story because it's not developing at the moment it's not that you're throwing it out you're just parking it you have to take that risk you have to learn how to do that don't you yeah, and um, I think I know when I was trying to when I, before I before I had no novels done when I just really wanted to write a novel, and I would have seen any hurdles like that as total failures. Like if I had spent a lot of time yeah. researching something and then went, no, I'm not doing that. I would have been oh, I've wasted my time every six months doing that. No, nothing like that. I don't. I completely changed my thinking about my writing because I feel every day, no matter what I read or no matter what I watch, it's all influencing me influencing me in some other way yes, and it yes. always comes out like everything and and I always say and I always kind of push it home because, because I went through that like I was I really struggled to get my first novel done um yes. but I was absolutely determined to do it but I got frustrated it took me so long or I thought I thought I was going to fail I thought it was never going to get picked up and I had all these insecurities that are very natural but once I got over them and realized and looked back on it I could see um that a lot of what I thought were mistakes or failures were actually learnings. And there's, there's a brilliant podcast by Elizabeth Day called How to Fail. Um, I think that's what it's called. And it's exactly that. It's people take mistakes they made or what they consider bad things that maybe happened in their lives, gave them a new learning and gave, turned yes. something positive. And um, it's, it's not that I'm a big spiritualist or anything like that. It's just that that has been my experience, like where things haven't worked out. It's, it's almost for a reason. Something else good has come of it. So if you're having problems or hurdles or you know, you, you've, you scrap your work or you move on to something else or you take time off. That's a big thing for me, freeing your brain of all the mush and all very the Very good. Yeah, very watching good point. TV. And that's yeah. where I got Adele's story. I was, I was going, one of my days, I, I watch Netflix almost as a treat if I can get the kids away and just myself. <laughs> um, and I'm like, what do I watch? Well, I'm going to watch a really boring documentary because I'm into it and no one else is. So I put it on and that's where Adele's story came out. And if I didn't yes. watch the documentary that day, I probably no, never would have found that story. So yeah. that's why I think you have to, like, my time off has always produced stuff maybe in other ways. And I think the creative brain works like that. Like I think COVID-19 um, shut lockdown for, I think there's a lot of people, there's some people who are, are absolutely like completely stressed and, you know, have had an awful time, but other people will have time to be creative and time to think back, think and look and assess their lives and go, what's really making me happy here? And what, where can I, you know, if I want to write this book, how am I going to do it? So yeah, I'm a big believer in giving yourself that bit of space and not, do, look, you, you know. do you feel that those skills now that you have honed and developed since 2017 and before that, um, well before that, you know, in, in, in taking the decision you did to do a journalism degree even, go back that far, do you feel that that was the right move for you? You know the way some people, they'll do a degree and then they'll feel, oh, I wish I'd taken a different route. I wish I hadn't done that degree. Uh, uh, why did I do religious education? I should have done science, you know? Yeah. Do you feel ultimately you made the right decision, that was the right road for you? Yeah, yeah I absolutely do. Um, because I didn't have a lot of choice at the time back in 
I mean, you're talking, it's nearly, it must be nearly 20 years ago. Um, so there wasn't any, I knew I wanted to write. Like I was doing very well in my school in, in, in English. And I was getting pulled up all the time for my fiction writing. But I also wanted a career. I wanted, I worked really hard in school to go out and earn money for myself. Um, it never crossed my mind that I'm going to go out and write a book and make money. And everybody knows it's very difficult to make money with novel writing anyway. So yes. I wanted a career. I wanted to write and get paid for it. And the only thing I could think of was journalism. And the only thing that was really available, there were communications courses, but even I didn't even understand what that was at the time. So I, that's why I did journalism. I was lucky to get on it. And um, I got great training and then I got into newspapers and then I got into, you know, just it, it led on to marketing and PR in different places where I was able to work and be creative and get paid for it. Um, yes. I still have maybe time to do my creative pursuits outside it. So yeah, it was definitely the right thing for me. But I was one of those people who knew at the age of, probably 14 I was going to do that you know I was doing my experience 15 16 in the newspapers where a lot of people like I was very driven and focused where some yes. people had no idea what they wanted to do and that just wasn't me like because I maybe because of my personality but also because I was convinced as to what I wanted to do and I felt lucky like that I didn't have this problem of I have no idea what I'm going to do so I understand that with people like I family members of best friends who has taken them to later life to find out what they really want to do and they're all yes. really successful in it, but it might take them to their thirties yes. or, or later. People always change. People are always changing there. Everything's very like dynamic. So, um, no, I was very happy with my choices. Um, and I don't think I'd change it. No, definitely not. And what would your advice be then to the young budding author out there or writer? Is it to go down the blogging route first or just dive in, follow your passion? No, like I would say with, with blogging, like, um, I, for me, that's, I, I don't know, I, don't, I, I wouldn't be starting there, but I would definitely be following what interests you. It might be, it could be spoken word, it could be uh, flash fiction, it could be, you know, getting printed in journals, it could be just going to a writer's group. Like, there's so many avenues as to, it could be podcasting, you know, um, I'm going to be doing a few courses, I think, actually this year on, on different, I'm trying to show all the avenues that uh, you can write, it'd be creative and put your work out, but it doesn't have to be in a novel. Yes. Um, so I think it's all about the story, isn't it? Storytelling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How you tell your story and how you, how you capture your characters. Yes. So I, I just think like there's so many opportunities really for, for any sort of anybody that wants to write or be creative with the way technology has gone, you can put, you can put your material out almost straight away. Yes. And I would say, like do it um but be care you know don't be thrown out anything be, be passionate about what you're doing and careful and put time and effort into it and be proud of everything that you put out and you can stand over i'd also say competitions are a fantastic way of putting deadlines on yourself and producing good work because you know it's going to be judged so you're not just sending off material that you just did up to enter you know you're, you're putting your time um it also gets you used to rejection and then when you get yes. a win, you feel on top of the world. If you get accepted or long listed or short listed. Um, so I think competitions are a fantastic way to, to get into writing uh, professionally. Very good. Now, we have a plethora of women, don't we, in this country who have, have uh, climbed the tree of success and become really, really good authors. I think we're very fortunate in this country. But we also are very fortunate locally because we've got people like you. You know, we, we've got people who are, who are in Ireland who are really making a name for themselves in the UK, in Ireland and abroad and turning out the most wonderful work. What would your advice be specifically to f women authors, female authors? Yeah, one, one author I'd, I'd give a shout out to is Nicola Pierce, actually. She's a um, fantastic local children's author. And yes. so, yeah, we do, we do have, um, you're right, we do have local authors. And that's brilliant because people can see then, well, I can do that. If she can do that, she lives in Terminal Beck and I can do that. <laughs> or, you know, it's great that um, we have, we've got authors all over Ireland. Um, what was the question? What was your advice on? What would your advice be to women? To women out there? To women? Yeah, women out uh, there. You know, because uh, women, I mean, like yourself, you know, some of them, they, they, they enjoy writing, but they've got so many other things going on in their lives. They've got their kids to look after, to find that time to actually have for yourself you know, to write for yourself and yeah. pursue that thing you love is hard, isn't it? You have to make the decision, I suppose, don't you, to just do it. Yeah, I suppose I'd say it's, it's, it would be for women and men, like, because I think, um, I don't know, I have, I have issues around maybe the way um, male writers are perceived as, as, as maybe sometimes over female writers. So I'd say, um, I think we should be on an equal platform. And yes. we, but we do have a, 
huge number of maybe female writers, um, but whether they get the recognition is, is, is you know, is a question. Um, I'd say for anybody, and you're right, like it, childcare can, can play a massive part in women's writing and it can, um, having to maybe work, maybe do a lot more in the home and look after children um, can be very difficult for a woman to get a space to write. Um, I think, like you said, you make the decision, you say, I'm going to do this for me and this is going to be my time. I'm going to do an hour a day or half an hour a day or two hours of the weekend. And you say, tell everyone around you and your family. And if you have to get the children minded, you do it. Or, you know, you build it in a way that it, it works for you. Um, you don't force it, but you just create a routine. And for me, that was fundamental in kind of getting my work done. Um, but it also gave me something else apart from my family and my commitments as a mother. It gave me another focus. And it gave you another focus. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that, it's, it's not always easy. Like even today, you know, if, if I have to get the children minded or whatever. And um, it, it's certainly, it's not always convenient, but like, look at, if you look at anybody that's trying to work now with kids at home and there's teachers working at home with children and all that. So, um, it's always going to be the, it, it's going to be the, the kind of, if, if you have a family, how do you fit your extra work in around it? One thing I'd say, um, getting on my political kind of heart now is I would love to see more supports for women writers who would like to pay for childcare to get to write. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, any grants or any, um, payments towards writers can be, only like they only give you maybe time away they say our support is a two-week residency in somewhere somewhere else which is fantastic but you try and give that to any working mother with small children and say go away for two weeks to write it's absolutely impossible yeah probably, probably for some men as well but I definitely think for women more so and I would love to see small grants available and I've brought it up at conferences and things before you know if somebody said here's 500 euro and you this is we're awarding you this for your childcare to write that would mean a huge amount to a woman yes. uh, in recognition of her right. Yeah, yeah. You know, she put that in an application. Putting and that your could money be, where your mouth that is. Could be X amount of days. Yeah. And she could literally go, okay, I'm going to get my novel done then. So I think um, we can all do our part, you know. Um, but I think if we really want to support women writers, there's, there's things that we can put in place. And you can put them in place by listening to writers. If, if, if you know, arts councils and um, the people in charge of giving out supports, it's, some of it's very simple stuff. Yes, absolutely. Gosh, Nicola, it's been an absolute joy talking to you. You are so you driven. Running, and you're running so for office now. <laughs> no, you're so interesting. This, this has been fantastic. I'm so delighted that you said yes and that you came on the show. This is Writer's Block with Miriam Kilmurray. We've had Nicola Cassidy with us today. Wonderful author, very driven. Keep an eye out for her work. Follow her on uh, Twitter. Instagram, Facebook. She's on all social media sites. I'm absolutely delighted that you were able to join us today on Writer's Block, Nicola, and I wish you every success with the next project. Oh, thanks, Amelia. Thanks for having me on, Miriam. No problem. I hope you'll come back to us soon. I will. Lovely. Okay, bye -bye thanks, Miriam. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, and thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>